Good evening, everybody. This is Robin with another edition of Horror Pop After Mid Midnight. And my guest tonight is C.J. Graham. He's known as Jason Voorhees from uh, Friday the 13th Part 6. And he's also Sergeant Bedlam, Hill Cop from Highway to Hell. How's it going, C.J.? Hey, good. Thank you for inviting me, Robin. I appreciate you having me on your show. Hey, thank you for coming on out of your busy schedule in the beautiful state of Montana on your ranch. Yeah, it's actually very nice today. It was 45 degrees and there's no snow, blue skies. That's why they call it Big Sky Montana, but it was beautiful. Yes, it is. And I used to go out there a lot when I was a kid. I have family in Missoula. Beautiful country, beautiful country. They had snow today, Missoula. Oh, did they? How much did they get? Yeah. They got a couple inches. I'm on the east side of Montana, like the banana belt, they call it. So we get snow, but at the same time, we don't get even one third the amount that the west side, which is Missoula and over on that side of the mountain next to the Rocky Mountains get. Hey, um, I'm over here in Ohio and uh, we only we only get between one to two inches of snow, which is no big deal. <laughs> yeah, we they don't when we do get five, six inches at a time, nothing changes. They don't school starts on time, everybody's at work like normal, it's just another day. All right, now let's talk about Six years ago, through Ancestry, you met your relatives for the first time, the Grams. Tell me a little bit about that and what was going through your head when you finally met some uh, family members. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people may or may not know that uh, my dad died in 1960. I was three years old, so uh, I grew up without a father. And, uh, you know, 50 years ago, I got the last two years of the Vietnam era war, which I went in the military 70 through through 75 and then through 78 in the Cold War. Um, when I retired a few years ago, I decided to move to Montana. And I knew I had Graham family up here that originated from Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, but I didn't know the, the capacity. Come to find out, Don Graham, who happens to be uh, about 85 years old, used to run with my father. He was about 21, 22 at the time. My father was 40, but my father was doing the rodeo circuit from Seattle to Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Uh, so with that being said, you know, I had like one article, which was a ring of my father's, and that's pretty much all I had of my father's, not much else. But then I met Don, and Don pulls out a shotgun, a complete custom saddle with my dad's name on it, Jack Graham, that he had had made in 1958, 1959 the backpacks, and a few other items that he used during the radio that were in mint condition because Don had taken care of them all these years because he was so close to my father. So I now have a few things of my father's that I never had. That's pretty cool. He was a legit rodeo cowboy. I, I mean, yeah, that... I've got pictures of him with the chaps that Don gave me, uh, custom chaps that had his initials on it, uh, JG, Jack Graham. And uh, I've got an old pitch with him standing with a cowboy in the, in the uh, chaps on. And like I said, the saddle and everything uh, has custom made up in Seattle back in the late 50s. And has his name and everything. Still has the rubber on it from when he was roping calves uh, in the rodeos. That's pretty cool. Now, you also have horses on your ranch, too. Um, let's talk about this beautiful horse, uh your wife uh, showed me a picture of him and you can tell me a little story about between you and him where you almost got killed. Tell me a little bit about Desperado. So my first horse I bought uh, was Desperado. He's a paint. Paints are a little attitude. He's black and white, blue, blue eyes, just like a Siberian Husky. He has a black tail, a white mane, one black eyelash, one white eyelash. And then throughout his body, he's 14, three hands. So he's a good sized horse. And the first time I got on him, I got maybe 50 feet, and he put me into the fence. So that was seven years ago. I've never got on again, just for the record. <laughs> He's way out of my lead as far as a rider. You know, I'm like a three, maybe a three and a half, a four, but he needs an eight or a nine. But you know what? I bought him. Uh, I would never get rid of him. I've kept him all these years. And then about three months after I got him, I bought, I bought another horse which is a Palomino, uh, Cashmere, I call her Cash. And she's very rideable, as is Lady, my wife, Sedona. But Desperado, he, uh, you know what? He just a wild-looking horse, and he's got a great look to him. And, you know, I'm not going to get rid of him just because. One of us is going to die. It's either him or me. 
<laughs> and I bet you when you're walking around that ranch, Desperado probably gives you that look. <laughs> oh, he does. He's got those blue eyes. But I will tell you the nice thing about all three horses. They'll be 10 acres away, and uh, it's time to come in. And I'll scream their names. They'll pull their head up off the grass, and they'll just start trotting real nice and easy all the way up the 10 acres, down the back five acres till they get to the barn. They go right in their stalls for the night, right where their food is, and I lock them up and say goodnight to them and close the door. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, They're, like, well-behaved. Those are probably like your kids. <laughs> they're big horses, but they're just like big dogs. <laughs> I, I believe it. Um, um, Before we got onto the podcast, um, let's talk about Harry. How much does Harry like being in your place of residence? Well, I got Harry, and, and if the fans recall a movie back, it was called Harry and the Hendersons, uh, about a Saskatchewan, a Bigfoot, and Harry got hit, and they took him home. Well, there is a gentleman, James, who has his own, uh, he makes all of his different special effects and different creations, and he made Harry. Harry is huge. Uh, he brought him to me at the show, what I just did a couple of weeks ago, and gave him to me. And I, I, I didn't even know what to do with it. It was so big. It's the size of my desk. You know, it's from the shoulders up. It looks just like Harry from Harry and the Hendersons, an exact replica. And it showed up at my door here last week. So I've got it mounted on my wall in my office, uh, right next to my, my uniform for the military. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Um, when you showed me that, that's a, that's a huge mount, man. You have it nicely mounted on the wall. Like you went out on a hunting expedition and killed Harry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let me, if, if I can, I'll go real slow so I don't get too delusional with your fans, but I got to show you this guys, because it's really amazing. I got to tell you, he did an amazing job. Uh, I'm going to go to this side of the camera as I go around and let you guys see Harry. That, we look like twins. Yeah, you guys do look like twins. You guys Thank can you. you guys can be tag team partners in pro wrestling. So anyway, that's Harry. And uh, I'm going to go back here because I know your fans are freaking out like because I'm moving all over the place. But <laughs> yeah, it's all mounted and uh, it looks great on the wall. I mean, I'm just I'm so impressed with the details and everything. Everything that James did, put it together. It's just totally shocking, and it's beautiful. That's awesome. Before you got into the business, were you a huge horror fan? I was old school. I'm a little older than some folks, so you know I'm still a universal horror mongo. I mean, I think of Frankenstein, the werewolf. Uh, you know, I take a look at Dracula and the mummy and go back to the Boris Karloff black and white days. Uh, so I was a big fan of all those. In my day, you used to be able to buy the models of Frankenstein or model of the werewolf. And they were just as important as the model cars we had with your 69 Camaro or your Mustang that you put together and put in your room. <laughs> those are pretty awesome. I love the Universal Monsters, too. Uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon's my favorite of them all, too. Which, um, they're great movies, and you can still watch them and enjoy them. I just like the uh, black and white of it. It gives it more of a creepier feeling. Yeah, you know, Creature in the Black Lagoon, you know, they did that back in the 50s. And Rico just passed away the last year. And, you know, he was my idol. I'd see him at conventions, and he'd be there 15 minutes early. And the convention was over at 6, and I'd go by him. He'd be there 15 minutes after. I mean, he was very dedicated. And to think about how they did all the special effects that weren't special effects. He really was underwater holding his breath fight scenes without safety divers. So they could get all the fight scenes out where at least I had safety divers around me with, with oxygen. He was just in a costume that was prefabbed and, you know, at bay with whatever happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. That took a lot of guts to do that. I mean, he was just like a stunt man too, but I mean, he was pretty well fit, too. That would be hard holding your breath like that wearing a costume. But um, anyways, since you like Frankenstein, um, remember the scene where you see the little girl, you know, with Frankenstein? So if we switch that scenario around and say it was Jason at Crystal Lake and this little girl came up and gave him a flyer, what do you think Jason would have done to that little girl? Well, let's go back to Friday the 13th, part six. Yes. 
And the little girl in the bed, when Jason bends over and gives her the teardrop look, and she starts praying that Jason's going to go away. When she opens her eyes, Jason is gone. There's a similarity there if you think about the, the content of how Jason is very curious about the little person. Now, unfortunately, in Frankenstein, he didn't understand throwing her in the water that she didn't know how to swim. He just thought that was like throwing the daisy in the water. In my case, you know, we made a little softer. Uh, let me tell you a true story about that young lady. Okay. That young lady is now in her 40s. And last year, she contacted Tom McLaughlin, the writer-director of Part 6, about getting a real nice Friday the 13th quality mask because her son was six or seven and wanted a Friday the 13th mask, but he wanted a real one. He didn't want one from Walmart. So Tom contacted me, and we got a real nice one that was made. I signed it, sent it to Tom. Tom signed it and then sent it back to Texas to that young lady. Like I said, she's in her 40s now, so she could give it to her son. So here we go. That's a beautiful story. And um, since you uh, played uh, Jason in part six, um, you're one of the popular Jason said um, everybody loves. So what got you into that role to play Jason? I mean, there was so many actors before uh, you, you know, besides Kane Hodder. Who? Yeah, who? <laughs> Never heard of him. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, who is I'm, he? I got to be honest. Like I've always told people, I got lucky. I didn't go to Los Angeles to be an actor, a stuntman, whatever. I went there to look at LAPD and the sheriff's office. I was running a nightclub. I was a general manager of an 18,000 square foot nightclub. And, uh, you know, it just happened on Thursdays. We had a change of pace where we had a hypnotist come in on stage, a live show. And the special effects people he brought in to shoot his video because he wanted to put a promotional tape together uh, suggested, hey, why don't we take CJ, big butt, in so many words, and put him in Ted White's wardrobe. We did all the special effects for part four, and he's about the right size, and he can. we'll put a breakaway screen, and we'll have him come through and scare the subjects. Uh, the rest is history, and when I say that, I mean it openly, because those guys kept saying, oh, we're going to cast you for Jason, we're going to cast you for Jason, and it just went in one ear and out the other ear, because we all hear about those, oh yeah, you're going to be a movie star, or an uh, icon of horror. Um but a few months later, I got a phone call to go down and meet Frank Manguzo Jr. at Paramount Studios and Tom McLaughlin, the writer-director, Michael Nomad, the stuntman, coordinator, and um, really, the rest is history. Here we are talking about it three decades later. Yeah, um, that's that's pretty awesome. I mean, to you know, be able to play an iconic role like that, I mean, be you know, up there, you know, the Mount Rushmore of Jasons, I mean, that has to be, you know, uh, freaking cool. Um now, let's talk about one of my favorite uh, um, indie horror films, um, Highway to Hell, where you played Hell Cop, Sergeant Bedlam. Oh, man. Right. I loved how you portrayed him, uh, your facial gestures and your mannerisms. You were playing a badass cop from hell. Um, what was it like to, uh, to play him, and how much uh, of a torture was it for you wearing all that makeup? Well, it was a full, uh, it took about five hours to get a wardrobe. And uh, the special effects team put me in the chair at about three o'clock in the morning. And that was near the end where MTV was very popular, 24 hours a day. And I would I would sit in the makeup chair and fall, you know, fall asleep at three, four or five o'clock in the morning as they're doing it. Every prosthetic on the front had to be glued on. Everything from my ears to my nose to my eyes to eyebrows so that the skin would move. Um, playing him was very unique. It's very, very unfortunate. A lot of people, they find out I played Hell Cop, they didn't know. But the unfortunate thing is, uh, Hemdale bankruptcied a couple of weeks before the distribution to the theater circuit. And it's interesting because it kind of sat dormant all those years until recently, the last few years ago, I believe it was United Artists and MGM bought the library. And now it's out on distribution where you can buy it at Walmart. And as people do see it, there really has a nice opportunity that would have been a, a great character. Um, the interesting thing is, um, you ever heard of Ben Stiller? Yes. Little guy? Yes. He, he, what, 20 million a movie, I think? Yes. <laughs> he was in it for about eight seconds. I slapped him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he loved Revenge it. Revenge on me. Thanks, Ben. Anyway, Ben was in it. His wonderful mother and father were in it. Uh, both of them have passed away. 
and his sister was in it. Uh, Christy Swanson, Buffy, the original Buffy the Vampire, was in it. Uh, Chad Lowe, Rob Lowe's younger brother, was in it. Uh, Patrick Burchin, who played the devil, was in uh, Sleeping with the Enemy opposite of Julia Roberts in that movie. So there were some very known characters in it, and obviously Mr. Stiller has went on to, to do some wonderful work um, as an artist. But it just didn't make national distribution because of the bankruptcy. Interesting thing, Rob, Robin, is I still have, I think, 10 of the original movie posters that were going out for distribution nice. from Hemdale in a Hemdale box that they sent me because I asked for some. And it's interesting because I've had them all these years since, what, 1990, 91? And I, well, sometimes I do see the movie poster they put out. It's the same one, but it's in color. The original was black and white. Oh, sweet. So I still have those, you know, in the Hemdale box in my garage sitting up there on the top of the boxes. That's pretty awesome because I, um, I loved Highway to Hell. Um, I remember renting it at a video store, at a mom-and-pop video store, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I mean, I like other horror films, but that would be in my top five. I just loved it. Um, you did some um, a lot of um, cool scenes in that movie. So did you do some of your stunts in that film too? I did some of them, but there were some driving scenes. I did some of the basic ones, but I did have a stunt man doing the heavy driving scenes. But with the exception of going through the wall of fire, that wasn't me. I did all the shipping of the gun until it blew and then they cut and then they blew it up and then the stun driver went through the planes. Uh, so I did was able to do a few of them. Most of the stunts they did were riding the motorcycles, if you recall. Yeah. And some stunts with the motorcycle riders. So that's where the big one came. But I was fortunate enough to be able to do a few of them uh, of my own, which is great. Just like in Friday the 13th, I did every single one of my own stunts, which is in itself an accomplishment considering I'd never been to stunt school I'd never done a stunt in my life until I stepped on the set of Friday the 13th and all of a sudden they're putting gel on me and setting me on fire and chaining me 20 feet underwater with chains, breathing off regulators and I'm throwing me through doors and walls and uh, putting cables on my back with a shotgun and just throwing me airborne. <laughs> so with that being said, I was very fortunate I didn't get hurt. I was reasonably athletic, but I had never been to a stunt school or anything. Everything I did for Friday the 13th and or Highway to Hell was OJT on the job training. Yeah, and how much fun was it doing your favorite kill where you were breaking the sheriff Mike Garris in half? That was interesting. I mean, it's a, that's my favorite kill in that movie. There's no blood, no guts, it's just pure power. But it's very interesting how they set that up, the illusion. There's two people in that stunt, and one person is, they dug a hole. One person leaned in and then put their head down the bottom hole so all you see is their butt and their legs yeah and then the sheriff just stood up and backed into them and then leaned forward so they were level put a pin so it looked like a jacket was connected and then i just pushed him backwards and he just laid back on the back of those legs so it was very simplistically done but at the same time great effect oh it was a great effect i, w I was amazed at that i was just like whoa and um, the thing I liked about those movies back in the day, uh, most of it was mostly like all practical effects, which, you know, right. I like too, because I'm a big practical effect fan. I mean, some CGI is all right. I just like the great practical effects. That's why I loved horror back in the 80s and early 90s, because um, it was all practical and they d made it look so lifelike and real and you can feel the pain in the kills of certain films you watched. Yeah, it's unfortunate because... Uh, there were some, the way the kills were done, like pulling a heart out of horse shack, it actually showed the heart pumping blood out of the vein and squirting in the air. All of that got cut, of course, because in those days that would be considered X rating. So they had to cut the heck out of it. The, the more unfortunate thing is in those days, it was really 35 millimeter tape. Mm -hmm. And when it was cut, it was on the floor and they just sweep it up and put it in the garbage it's gone where today everything is digitalized and they save it and you can go back and do a director's cut. I wish Tom could go back and do a director's cut of part six now and add the gruesome, all the details that he was had to take out due to the rating process back then. I would pay to see that the gorier, the better. <laughs> yeah. But nowadays you can't get, a, you can't uh, get away with that, you know, because of, you know, 
of today's culture and all that, and that cancel culture and all that, um, they would be making a big fuss about it. That's why films were so good back in the day. But um, also, um, you also turned down uh, Freddy vs. Jason too as well. Is that true? Well, it's 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 two twofold. Um, I was slaughtered to do part seven, mm. and Kane will tell you the same thing, uh, that they were satisfied with my, my, my work in six. Um, but Kane will tell you also that John was doing the directing and the special effects, and he'd worked with John. He Kane's a huge, huge horror fan. So Kane talked to John. John then went to Paramount and made the change so that Kane... Now, going through, you know, Kane's been a great ambassador for this for this franchise, um, he's helped put as an iconic image that it's become with his doing four parts. And when um, the Jason versus the Freddy came out, um, I was the chief operating officer, general manager of two casino resorts mm-hmm. with about 2,300 employees. And management approached me and in, would I have an interest? Uh, they wanted to change Jason back to a little larger. I'm a little bigger than Kane. Um, and the problem with that is, you know, yeah, they're going to pay you a couple dollars to do the movie. But um, when you're running casino resorts as a position of that, and obviously you're making a lot more money than you would do a movie. So it wasn't logical to quit running the casinos that I had risen to the top at all my career to go do an eight-week shoot and then be unemployed. It just wasn't logical. The numbers didn't line up. You know, I mean, the difference between what they were going to pay me while I was making a year was five times the difference. Um, so I just passed on the opportunity and let it go at that. Now, let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about conventions and your fans. How much do you love your fans, and what were some of the great experiences you've had with your fans through all these conventions you've been doing? Well, I think the greatest thing about the fans is the loyalty. Uh, And I go back to Kane. I love Kane Hunter. I bust his chops all the time. And I know he cares about me. I'm probably the closest person uh, that played Jason or in the industry that he appreciates, because he knows I ran casino resorts. It was my career. I did it for over 20 years, and now that I'm retired from it, I go do the conventions. But I see Kane, but he's been doing this for 20 years out there, doing these conventions, when there used to just be a dozen Mm -hmm. throughout the United States. Now there's three or four dozen throughout the United States, and a half a dozen in Europe. Um, So I always give him kudos for all the hard work he's done out there. The fans, though, they just keep coming. Um, let's go back to uh, this last show. I had a young person come up to me, five years old, and was a horror fan. Five years old. Awesome. Now, his daddy, who brought him, who was a horror fan, wasn't even born when Friday the 13th Part 6 came out. Wow. You know, He was like 33 years old, and I'm thinking, you weren't even born. So, But he learned it from his father. So we're looking at a generational uh, change. And it's just amazing. I'm so humbly appreciative. I had no idea that three decades ago, playing Jason Voorhees, Friday the 13th, which was just a B-movie, as they called it back then, would become such an iconic revolution between Friday the 13th, Michael Myers, hell, and uh, looking over at, you know, good old Robert England, you know, taking care of uh, him. And then, of course, you know, you can't forget Leatherface. So I call it the four musketeers of the 80s have become the iconic image as a universal horror had been back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, Terrifier and everybody that's out, it and all those, I wish them the very best. They've had a great run the last couple, three years, and I hope they just scare. I just hope they keep going, scream. Um, if they're lucky to go two decades, it's one thing, but if they can make it three decades like we have, four decades, in some cases, um, it would just be amazing for them to, but sometimes you get lucky. And I always tell people I got lucky. So I'm extremely appreciative when I meet the fans. Yeah. So have you seen the Terrifier films? Oh yes. One, one and two, because I see David and the guys at the shows. Uh, I see everybody at the shows from scream all the way down to Michael Myers. You know I mean? When Michael has to sit next to me, whoever it is, Tyler, Maine, Tony, you know, they already know I'm going to razz them, just like I razz Kane Hodder. And I always tell everybody, when they're sitting right next to me, real men, we use a machete, not an Outback steak knife. <laughs> Where's the A1 steak sauce? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, and so I've even had a t-shirt made with Michael Myers on the front, on the back, says real men use a machete. 
<laughs> they know what I'm going to do, so they don't get mad at me. But it's just that brotherly rivalry. It's Kane Hodder, I do the same thing. If he's late to the show one day, I run over to his table and put some of my pictures in his pictures, autograph them real quick, and eventually they'll take one off, and then there's a picture of me autographed for that same person. He'll tear it up and send it back to my table. That's funny. Um, you were also okay. on the mu- you were also on the music video with Alice Cooper, and you also got to see a little bit more of Alice Cooper at conventions as well. Actually, it's been a great honor. Um, two story, nineteen seventy three ish. I was sixteen. I went in the military when I was seventeen and seventy four. My first concert I ever went to was Alice Cooper. Welcome to my nightmare in Seattle, Washington. And then to be able to work with him in 86 to do the movie and then see him probably, I see him conservatively every 18 months, 12 to 18 months at a show. Uh, we just did a show back in November, Monster Mania. And uh, I put full wardrobe on and came out, took pictures with the fans, Alice Cooper. And it was a great time. So I have the, the blessing that I get to see him on a regular basis. And he embraces, I mean, he really does. He embraces the horror concept because of his show welcome to my nightmare has always been a a spinoff of differences you know the guillotine the snake um so he's a great guy great personality great golfer um it's an honor to get to stand next to him and do things with him like i said that had been fun doing that music video i mean that had been wild you know being there seeing alice we did a lot of photo sessions together um i have one on the wall over here that's him and i uh, and he autographed it for me. I autographed it for him. And it's uh, me holding him by the throat in full wardrobe when we were doing all the different photos That's back pre- in 1986. Um, speaking of your fans, was there a, a memorable moment of one fan that really touched you that you can still remember this day? I do. You know, I really have a real sensitive one. Um, There's one young man last year. He's five years, six years old. Just a little monkey. And he came in to do photos with me. And he he walked me back to my room, holding my hand in the hallway in full wardrobe. And his father took a picture of the back of us with this little person holding my hand as we walked through the hallway, going back to take me as an escort to my room. Um, I think when people see that, they're like, really? I mean, they don't see Jason as being a caring or a tentative person, but I will tell you, those young fans, I always try to get more engaged with them because when they come to my table, a lot of times they'll bring me drawings that they've done. Sometimes they're drawings with three fingers, with, you know, crayons. Sometimes they're elaborate drawings, and they always want to give them to me. And I'm, I always tell them, no, nope, businessman, I'll sign yours for me. And sometimes they can only print. And give it to me, and then you pick a picture, and I'll sign it and give it to you. We'll trade. Because I want them to know that, you know, I don't want anything for free. I'm appreciative, but I also want to give something back to that young person. Um, since you've been in some films, um, is um, if you had another chance of being in a film besides horror, where do you see you uh, acting? What type of genre of film would you see uh, you uh, doing besides a horror film? Yeah, unfortunately, because of being 6'3", 250, uh, it's not an age factor. It's just you're always going to see me as a bad person or like a rebel movie or uh, a military movie since I'm ex-military because it fits my demeanor. Um, you're not going to see me standing next to Mr. Cruz. You know, he's 5'8". <laughs> um, it's odd. I'm 6'3". So I would be the villain in whatever I did. But as you notice, uh, Reacher just came out recently yes. the last two seasons. That dude is, he's give or take 6'3", and about 250, 260. So I think times have changed where the larger guys can come in. So look at what Reacher has done, which originally was done by Tom Cruise. Let's remember that. And now they've, they've got a show called Reacher. Um, Dunes, I think, would be something because of the characters in the wardrobe. Halo. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm the perfect size for something like that with the helmet and stuff because of the military. So I think it'd be one of those more action-related films. I don't see myself as a uh, Hallmark <laughs> actor. Um, I don't think I have enough skill to be to do that, to be quite honest. Uh, but I think the other things I could do, and I could pull it off with uh, dominance. Yeah, I can also see you being a, a pro wrestler, too. You know, it's funny you say that, because way back in the 80s, 
we had talked about that. What if I go to pro wrestling? I can come out as Jason with the hockey mask on. And we had all these different concepts thinking a good friend of mine, uh, Darren McVie, he was a, a pro wrestler, as was his wife back in those days. Uh, he also played Conan uh, up at Universal Studios back in those 80s because we all worked out at the Gold's Gym in North Hollywood. So we all knew everybody. Uh, you know, R.A., who did Leatherface, he went out for the Jason, and I got it. He used to always, who, who's this CJ guy? Who's this CJ? And he finally met me at the gym, and he goes, oh, man, I was so mad at you because I can't not like you. You're a good guy. <laughs> and I still see him today. We talk about working out at Gold's Gym and everybody in the gym going out for the Gladiators and all the different shows that were very, very popular back in the late 80s, early 90s. Oh, heck yeah. I remember the American Gladiators, man. You had to be uh, a... Darren McBee was Malibu with the blonde hair. Yeah, Malibu was one of my favorites, but, you know, um, I also liked Nitro, too. He was a mean badass, too, so... Nitro's a great guy. He was, too. We worked on the same gen. Now, true story, uh, uh, Darren, you may not know this, but Darren also worked with me at Chippendales down in Culver City. <laughs> you were a Chippendale dancer? <laughs> yeah, see on the back wall? <laughs> yeah. Darren's Cuffs and Collars. Eat your heart out, Robin. Oh, yeah. I bet, I bet you had all the wait, ladies swimming on you. <laughs> I'm going to take the Fifth Amendment on that. Very... <laughs> hey. I'm trained well. Keep my mouth shut. That's right. That's Hey, that's but a great... Darren also worked at Chippendales, just so you know. He also did Conan, and he played Malibu. I think he only was on one season. He got pretty beat up because all the gladiators talked about, there was no, you had to go full force all the time, even when you were hurt. Uh, he got beat pretty bad a couple times, knocked off those towers. Oh, that's pretty wild. Um, have you ever thought about like maybe writing a uh, a book? Listen, grammar is my worst subject in school. <laughs> Writing and spelling. I'll look at you in the eye and say it's not my thing. I can run a casino resort, numbers, statistics, algorithms. I can put you know conservatively, you know, a five hundred million dollar income together with a billion dollar resort. I can do an EBITDA of forty two, forty three percent. But when it comes to writing skills, I don't have the skill. That's why I have executive assistants at each of the resorts because I can. they'll go ahead and take notes of what I want and they'll put it into a writing form. But I, it could be interesting if I did lock down. Kane did a great one. You know, unfortunately, Kane burned a lot of his body when he yeah. was younger doing a stunt in Reno, Nevada. And uh, he did the one from Hell, uh, Hell and Back, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, mine just more of a creative you got to realize I didn't have a father I went to the military at 17 uh, here I go through and I become a dealer at Circus Circus in Reno wearing a pink shirt I go to LA I get to play Jason I get to play Hell Cop I get to do 6 or 7 commercials uh, play it at, at, at uh, Chippendales and then I go back into the casino industry in Las Vegas and I finally retire as a chief operating officer general manager over two casino resorts so I started and just kept going up the ranks. So I've been very successful, and I always say I've got my high school diploma right next to my four-year military degree, which is my honorable discharge. So I never went to college. Yeah, um, my uh, dad did. My dad served in um, served in Nam. He was a CB, and then when he got out, I believe it was seventy or seventy-one. Uh, he went through school through the GI Bill and got his degree. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I I had people working for me that had MBAs and this and that, but at the end of the day, I, you know, I used to tell them I got a PhD in common sense. I'm willing to put brain panels together any day of the week. All right. Um, really, it's not that complicated to run a business of that magnitude. I mean, I had a little over $102 million payroll benefit package every year, over $500 million in revenues, you know, a $75 million budget for marketing. It isn't really that hard. It's just you got to take a look and see what's going to give you an ROI, a return on the investment that makes logical sense. Oh, I, I totally believe that. Um, one more question. Um, let's talk about your wife. How supportive is she been through your career and all that? It seems like she's having fun with it too. Yeah, Ruby, Ruby and I have been together 13 years. Um, the nice thing about Ruby is, you know, she's a ball of energy. Uh, she's 10 years younger than me, which isn't a lot, but it's mm -hmm. still 10 years. And you know what? She enjoys it. She's very proud of me, which is really nice, very supportive. You know, she's more the um, executive assistant, going back to what I said. Yeah. She goes and coordinates everything. And if you go looking on my 
my tree link. You'll find where all the shows I'm doing. And mm-hmm. got her contact if you want me to do a show. And she helps me with all that. I mean, I'm good at it. I have mm-hmm. no problem doing it. But I'd rather one person handle that connectivity and then just tell me, hey, you got to be a Zoom. You're doing Robin's show, 6 o'clock Tuesday. Be there. Um, got it. I can take care of it. I can speak. Uh, um, you know, I'm reasonably intelligent, as you can tell. I can connect my words without a stuttering. Um, and I don't really get into too deep of a detail where I corner myself. Yeah. Um, but I'm very appreciative for the fans and what they've allowed me to become. So when I do shows, a good example is, you know, I do charge for autograph photos and this and that. But I'm one of the few people that don't charge for selfies. I just jump up and take pictures with anybody wants a picture for free. Um, you know, military people come through, active duty. You know, I, I can relate to all of them. You know, every once in a while I get a Marine come through and I got to give them a hard time because I'm Army. You know, I remind them that their paycheck said Department of Navy. <laughs> there, is, there is no Department of Marines. And, you know, they, they kind of give me that center finger and they always give me that, well, they're Uber for us, you know, or I work in the men's department. But I even call people at home on the phone that can't make it that are military because they're at Fort Campbell or wherever they're at at the moment. I say, call them right now, call them. And I'll talk to them on the phone for two, three minutes while people are in line just thanking them for their service and all their hard work that I appreciate them very much. I understand what they're doing and, you know, come home safe. Amen to that. Um, I have family that's in the military as well, and I totally agree with you on that. Um, Also, uh, you uh, worked with Grunt Style, too. Yeah, Grunt Style, I wear a lot of their shirts. Um, I've been wearing them for years, but I've also taken a couple of them and modified them in the front with a hockey mask. And one of their reps saw me and said, hey, where'd that shirt? I said, I just had it made. I had added to it. Uh, but they were kind enough last year to call me uh, and flew me into Texas to do some photos. They do a lot of photos on their website of soldiers, and the entire company is pretty much entirely veterans, uh, including the owner. And they have a podcast and stuff, but I, I flew down there and, and did their new shirt. You know, you can't kill the boogeyman. Um, and it had a big old knife on it. It's a bayonet. I think it was a Marine band that don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we did a couple things outside for them with a lot of pictures and stuff, but I understand the shirt was one of the best sellers last year in totality. Oh, heck yeah. They made some good money, man. Of course. Yeah. I'd be sporting that shirt, it's, it's too. A, it's a cool shirt on the back says you can't kill the boogeyman. <laughs> and it's got, it really is a, a K-Bar, which is the favorite marine knife, hunting knife that they use. Even today, a lot of them still use it because it's so old. It goes all the way back to like World War II in Korea. <laughs> so um, what are some of the next shows and what are you going to do next so your fans know what you're going to be doing well if anybody wants to really know you can just go to my link tree and uh, everything lines up on it every show I'm doing this year uh, my next show is going to be the Marine Toy Con and then I do everything from the Tulsa Horror Con to Whorehound coming up in uh Whoa, about two months? No, it's coming up It's coming up this month. Up this year. Whorehounds this month. Yeah, they do two. They're going to also do one in September. Oh, are they going to do one in September? We're at. I, I know it's not Indianapolis. I know that because they had a... It's not the Indianapolis. I believe it's Cincinnati. And it's, I believe, if I remember correctly, Friday the 13th, September 13th this year. Yes. That's awesome because... Um, they're doing uh, the same thing here in Cincinnati in March. And that's cool. They're going to be doing it in September. Uh, that was a great, so, that's a great scoop. Yeah. So they, you know, they, everybody do it. Then of course, uh, Tulsa Horn, our con, which is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just contacted me last week and decided to do a show on December 13th and 14th which December 13th is also a Friday the 13th. They're going to turn that entire convention into a Friday the 13th, uh, showing with the movies and a lot of the actors and actresses that were involved in the different Friday the 13th. So I have about 15 shows picked out that I'll be doing uh, over the next five months. That's pretty cool, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at Whorehound in September this year. Um, It'll be a uh, good chance to get to meet you in person. It'll be my first time ever meeting you in person. So, All right, I'll bring a machete and take you out. 
Yeah, oh, yeah, you better, yeah, you to bring that and take the machete out. You know, don't be tying me up in a sleeping bag up in the tree and start beating me to death. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming on, uh, sharing your story. It was a blast. Uh, uh, thank you t- for your wife for uh, setting this up and, you know, tell me some great stories about you, too. It was a blast. No problem. Hey, Robin, I appreciate you inviting me. Uh, all the fans out there, you know, Friday the 13th and so on, thank you for being fans. I can't tell you how much I personally, and I can speak for Kane and everybody, appreciate you. Um, I think Friday the 13th has got one of the loyalist followings in the world, and I don't mean that voice boasting like, oh, yeah, I really mean that. Uh, there are Friday the 13th fans everywhere. It's not a normal conversation you would have at the copy machine at the office, but if someone mentions Friday the 13th, you'd be surprised how many closet Friday the 13th fans there are. Oh, I totally, I totally believe it. I mean, I could see that. I mean, I've had conversations, you know, at work about Friday the 13th too. Um, I'm more of a big um, Phantasm fan. I always like Angus Grimm as the tall man. I was more into the Phantasm films, you know, but I love my Friday the 13th and I also love my Halloween films too, but it seems like, no one hardly ever talks about Phantasm. When you mention it, they're like, what's that? <laughs> yeah, I know what it is, but like I said, now now that you know about Friday the 13th, just remember about the machete. Oh, now you're going to get me scared. So I'm coming to Cincinnati. I'm going to be freaking out. Coming near you, I'll be like, oh. real, real men use a machete, not an Outback steak knife. <laughs> hey, make sure you bring the A1 steak sauce too, right? <laughs> There you go. All right. Thank you. All right. Hey, thank you so much for having me on the show. Have a safe night. Fans, thank you so much for supporting us and being a fan of Friday the 13th. We'll see you out there on the road. And everybody, thank you for listening to Horror Pop After Midnight. Have a great evening.